after deploying, you kind of look at the world a little differently. You know, one minute you're in a in a war zone, and the next you're in in a supermarket, and everyone there is worried about how long they have to wait in a queue or how much the price of petrol is. And the things that are going through my mind are, don't you know what's going on across the world? Don't you know there's women and children being murdered and massacred? Don't you know there's bigger problems? When you've been in the military, there's a whole range of safety nets there. There are chaplains, there are doctors, there are psychologists that can provide a whole range of support. Then when you get out of the system, there's all of a sudden uh, nobody prompting you to get, to get health checks, nobody uh, saying that, okay, we're at the six month mark, you're going to get a dental or you're going to get a full physical checkup. You're totally on your own and it can be quite bewildering. In fact, you can deteriorate very, very quickly without even noticing it. It got to a level where it was impacting my, my daily life and all it did was make me want to isolate. In my 47 years in the military and the police, I experienced many deployments overseas. In the first instance, you're excited about going because you want to make a difference in the world. You want to bring peace to troubled peoples. I deployed to East Timor four times or five times, maybe with the military. Four of us went straight to uh, the border and deployed within one week of graduating in Canberra. Everyone in the military um, wants to go to, to be deployed on warlike operations or, or peacetime operations because it's where we have a real impact. So for me, it was a massive level of excitement um, when I first deployed to Afghanistan in 2008. I went back in 2004 as an advisor to the Timorese military as uh, the training team uh, commander for the 1st Infantry Battalion, which was mostly comprised of uh, Timorese guerrilla fighters who'd fought for 24 years against Indonesian occupation. Today, we've got soldiers that have had many deployments in many different sort of situations, and all of this becomes cumulative. The stress of each deployment sort of builds. Uh, initially, the stress improves our performance, but you get to a culminating point where your stress is, is too much, and then your performance starts to degrade, where eventually, and this has happened three times in my life, eventually the stress gets you to a point of complete breakdown, where you just can't do anything battle stress or PTSD um, was something that was talked about in the military, it was talked about pre-deployment and stuff, but so I saw it as a weakness effectively and I certainly didn't think it was ever something I'd need to worry about. A civil war or civil crisis erupted in 2006 which went on for about three years. I'd say certainly at that time in 2007 I was uh, deep in the throes of post-traumatic stress and uh, I started seeing a psychiatrist um, probably a couple of years later, uh, but I had very, very heavy symptoms uh, through 2007 and 2008, 2009. On the 19th of October 2009, I was wounded by an improvised explosive device. Uh, that IED detonated within one metre from me, and from that I was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury, blast injuries, and all my uh, hearing in my right ear was gone and then subsequently post-traumatic stress disorder and major depressive disorder. So it was once I was back home, started to have a few weird things going on, like uh, some pretty horrific nightmares, reliving events, um, even hallucinations, um, massive spikes in anger, sort of uncontrollable anger, um, sleeplessness, anxiety. I'd never heard of a panic attack before, and, when I had one for the first time, it was a horrific experience. My ability to sleep, to focus, my ability to have relationships, to communicate, to fit in with any crowd anywhere, whether it be a social environment uh, or civilian friends, uh, just completely lost. Uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to keep, keep cool. I tell people, I came home from the war but the war came home with me. You come back with a whole range of, of issues. My wife often says you came back as a different man and that frustrated me. I'm like, I'm the same person, you know, like 
um, but I was different. I was angry, I was depressed. I was no longer sort of this guy who viewed the world as a really great place and, and we've got opportunity and, and things to do. That was all stripped away from me. I kind of felt that I'd lost my identity and lost my purpose in life. No soldier wants to be off, offline and not deploying and not being active and not going to work. So uh, there's a, a huge culture in the military of not uh, presenting with injuries. There are many challenges for a veteran and their family when the veteran comes home from a deployment. You might have physical injuries, you've certainly had a lot of stress, you might have developed anxiety or depression as a result of your, your, your service overseas. You might have moral injuries, you might be conflicted because of bad things that you've seen, bad decisions that you've made. Um, you might be feeling guilt about things that you have done or that you should have done. So you bring all of this sort of baggage back with you and it's, an, it's like an enormous burden on your back. Returning uh, back to Australia was very hard and because all my friends and who I think are my family, my service family, were still on operations. I uh, was medically discharged and upon being medically discharged, being back in the civilian world, uh, was quite difficult. My family was defence and now I couldn't be with them. Coming back I had a massive amount of adrenal fatigue. Um, I'd try to get involved with things that would kind of pick up my adrenaline you know, go riding a motorbike or, um, you know, doing stupid things. So it was kind of like chasing, chasing the ability to feel lifted up, but constantly feeling like you're underwater. Certainly when I came home from the Iran-Iraq war, I was in very bad shape. I was hypervigilant, hyperaroused, hypersensitive, very quick to react to things. I had over 10 years of horrific sleeping horrific nightmares. It was like constantly being sucked in and sucked in and sucked in uh, to the twilight zone and being scared to go to sleep, being uh, sweating and shit scared waking up. During those times I got really low. Um, probably resulted in um, feelings of s suicide and, and um, just getting to the point of complete surrender. You just, I can't go on like this. The biggest challenge for veterans when they come back from operations, and certainly when they leave the military, is, is reintegrating into family life. Things were pretty rocky at home. Zoe had sort of been raising three kids by herself for, for over a year and uh, really needed support in the home front. And so she, she gave me a bit of an ultimatum, right, you've always put the military first. It's now time to put your family first. Um, it's us or them. So I remember in the depths of my depression, I was sitting on the ed edge of my bed, uh, my head in my hands, just sobbing. I was absolutely miserable. I couldn't think of any reason why I should be alive. I thought I was worthless and everything, every voice in my head was saying, just end your life because you're a burden. And my daughter, Eden, came in. She would have been about four and she kept, she kept trying to like snuggle in and, and give me a cuddle. And I just kept pushing her away. And um, I must have pushed her away like five or six times, but she was just persistent. <laughs> and she got in and she got her arms up around my neck and pulled, pulled herself up to me and she whispered in my ear, I love you, Dad. And something broke, you know, I thought I'd forgotten how to love, but that, innocent love of, of Eden that day broke something in my heart and I thought, wow, I do love you. I just don't express it very well at the moment. And uh, I remember hugging her for ages, absolutely ages. And that was, a, you know, one of those key moments in my journey where I thought, I've got to keep going. I'm not going to give up. I don't care how hard it gets. I'm just not going to give up. So, um, yeah, the journey really really began with medical treatment. I was admitted into a psychiatric hospital. I thought, you know, this isn't very good. Um, but I had to start somewhere. Started doing PTSD programs. Um, started to learn how to talk about my problems, how to share my story, and started to realise I wasn't alone. So the help that definitely pulled me out of uh, 
the absolute abyss uh, was my immediate family and a very small group of very close and old friends. For me to bounce back was wholly and solely due to my wife, um, pushing me to get help, pushing me to speak about how I felt. The first step, I suppose, was talking to my partner. I was talking to Zoe about what was actually going on in my mind and some of the struggles that I was living with. That automatically meant someone else was on my side. It was only through Dad, my father, giving me, uh, pushing paperwork in front of me, making appointments for me and saying, Matt, you need some help. There are quite a number of obstacles for veterans in terms of getting help. The first one is that the veteran might not want to ask for help. Breaking the stigma and breaking the obstacles is about sitting here talking about it. I'm an infantry soldier telling you that I've had or still do have mental illness. When my friends come to me and say, I'm not tracking well or I feel like this, that's great. I'm glad that they talk to me, but I think it's more important to also have a clinician and have someone that can give you more tools in your toolbox to be, uh, to be healthy. The key message I would say to veterans is that hope is available, hope is possible, healing is possible. Find hope, hang on to it, seek healing through whatever avenues you can and redefine your purpose in life. The best thing that you can possibly do is to help others. The more we move forward and the more we help others, uh, the more fulfilling our lives are going to be and the happier our lives are going to be and that's what it's all about.